the United States Airborne have always been about heavy firepower and small packages. When you're hitting the combat zone from the skies, you need military tech that is deadly but lightweight. Today's airborne troop can take out his targets with his trusty M4 or bunker bust with the Javelin missile. Rewind to the paratrooper of World War II, armed with specially adapted carbines and submachine guns that could be carried into combat from the air. These weapons and the men who use them would soon be tested to their absolute limits. July 1943, the U.S. Airborne assaults the Mediterranean island of Sicily. When they got there, there was extremely high winds. There was such a dispersion of jumpers. They were scattered all over Sicily. Moffat Burris was parachuted onto the island, but soon discovered he'd been dropped way off target. They dumped us out 55 miles from the drop zone, and I never saw my unit during the entire Sicilian campaign. Despite a disastrous drop, the Airborne did what Airborne do best, hit the enemy hard and fast. At their side, tried and trusted firepower like the Thompson submachine gun. The first submachine guns, like the MP-18, were used by German troops in World War I. The Thompson would become the next deadly development. Originally produced in 1921, the Tommy gun was appreciated for its raw killing power. Now, this was loved by the airborne troops mainly because of its size, its weight, and its hitting power. Dropped deep into the heart of enemy territory, the airborne needed a gun that was ready to fire as soon as that trooper was out of his harness. You can basically land with this on impact, load a clip into the, into the magazine well, cock it, and be ready to fire at anything that was around you. World War II paratroopers would land with a variety of weapons. Some, like the M1 Garand rifle, had to be reassembled once on the ground. This could cost precious time when under enemy fire. The Thompson hit the deck ready to rock and roll with 700 rounds per minute. Designed by General John T. Thompson, the Tommy gun was first known as the Annihilator. It's easy to see why with the hail of lead bullets that it unleashes. You could deliver a lot of large ammo real quick and inject lead poisoning to the enemy. It could save your life. They don't like to see a lot of lead coming their direction. The enemy does not. The Thompson fired a bullet that was almost half an inch thick. This slow-moving lump of hot lead caused serious damage to the German and Italian defenders of Sicily. The most important thing is the stopping power of the caliber of the round. It's 0.45 inches in diameter. It's a very large cartridge, very powerful at close quarters. If an enemy gets hit with this slug, he's going down. A close quarters combat lead sprayer was crucial to U.S. airborne troops. But the Tommy gun was slow and expensive to manufacture. The next stage of development would be a cheaper, mass-produced submachine gun, the M3. This is the M3 grease gun. And this was called a grease gun because it looks like a grease gun. This is one of the great sounding weapons of all time. When this thing goes off, it makes a tremendous sound. The M3 was manufactured off of the General Motors production line at half the cost of the Thompson. This grease gun could fire 450 rounds per minute, but weighed in at just over eight pounds, making it an ideal weapon for the paratroopers. The reason it was important for the paratroopers is they can actually hold this close to their chest while they're ready to exit the C-47, and they're gonna have a guy right in front of them. If they had a, an assembled Garand, or if they had a BAR, if they had a machine gun, it's gonna be very cumbersome, and you've got static lines hanging that they could get entangled with. By having this close to their chest, they had very small chance of the entanglement happening with this type of firearm. The airborne submachine guns proved essential as they fought their way through Europe. Often, the odds were stacked against them, 
even before they hit solid ground.